All right, we're going to go ahead and get fired up here in another minute or two. So thank you. All right, we have everything underway. So I'd like to welcome you to uh, Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology um, in our 3D plastic printing forum. And uh, we have people both uh, live here uh, present as well as online. So we'd like to welcome uh, everyone, our online people as well. Um, additive manufacturing, 3D printing uh, is evolving rapidly. Um, it, it has a history in um, uh, you know, rapid prototyping in particular, but it's, it's rapidly moving from that world into the world of manufacturing. And so businesses of all sizes and all industries are embracing additive as a, a tool um, that can add a lot of value to their company and to the work that they're doing. So uh, once again, welcome. I'd like to introduce our CEO for some opening comments. So Ron Angelo, come on down. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'll make my comments brief. And I, I was told uh, there may be a little issue uh, for those that are remote uh, on the chat feature. So if they could put their questions in the chat and we will uh, ask those uh, those questions after. But again, thank you for everyone here being present and remote. Uh, hopefully you're gonna enjoy the program. I know you will actually. Uh, it's been a fascinating kind of journey for me on the whole 3D printing side and the effort that everyone's been putting in here. I would like to acknowledge Mike Rushlow over there. Mike is not just with PTA Plastics, but he's also a representative of the Manufacturing Innovation Fund uh, here in the state of Connecticut. He's on the board there as well as the regional sector partnerships. Why I say this is there's a massive push and I got to tell you, Connecticut versus other states right now, I mean, we're just doing an amazing job with programs. There is grant funding. There are programs for training. There's programs for demonstrations. All these things to support 3D printing. How do we move this forward? How do we help companies adopt? How do we help companies move forward with their technology and their workforce? How do we help on the training side? Mike is first and foremost. So thank you for the support of that. The state of Connecticut, I think you're going to be hearing from Connecticut's chief manufacturing officer in a little bit. Um, but for me, it's an incredible journey. Listen, to these guys. It's very humbling for me every day to come in and see the work here. I don't know what you guys know. Um, I'm learning every day on this, so it's a great journey. So um, I don't want to hold up the program, but again, thank you for coming here. I hope you enjoy the facility, the tour. Um, folks are here to answer whatever questions you have, and not just today, but certainly going forward in the days and weeks to come. So thank you. Jeff? All right. Uh, we're back stuck again here. All right, so quick agenda. We have a number of uh, presenters today, panel discussion, a technical conversation. Um, so we have a lot uh, to go through very quickly. Um, at four o'clock, this officially ends and we have a tour scheduled. So uh, I would encourage you if you have time to stay for the tour um, and, uh, and take advantage of that. 
uh, CCAT's mission was supposed to be behind Ron when he was speaking, but uh, we'll go on. Logistics, uh, we ask that you don't take photos or videos inside the facility. Uh, we do work that's customer proprietary or ITAR restricted, and so uh, we ask no images. Uh, restrooms are on the other side of this wall. Uh, they were facing the entrance when you came in the door. Um, the fire exits and assembly, if there were to be an event, uh, and if you folks on uh, online want to join us, you're welcome to, but we'll go out through the front door and uh, we'll follow Donna uh, to the flagpole and assemble there. And then last but not least, uh, when this is over with, everyone in attendance, uh, we'll be able to, uh, we'll ask to fill out a survey. So it's important to us to get your feedback to help us understand how to improve what we're doing. And so we, we thank you in advance for that. For people that are online, your host today is Eileen Candles, who's the Director of Partnerships at CCAT. And we thank you. So go ahead and type your questions into the chat or uh, into the question box and she will relate them to us. If you have any technical uh, issues, uh, any audio issues, she's the, the go-to person to chat with and uh, we'll keep the online going. So very quickly, uh, we're gonna try very desperately to keep to our schedule. Um, CCAT is a not-for-profit. We've been in existence for almost 20 years. And uh, what we do is to look, introduce technology uh, to people, to companies, uh, validate that by uh, doing demonstration projects with them. Uh, we can assist with the adoption of the technology. Um, and the whole goal is to get uh, advanced technologies into the hands of the manufacturers in Connecticut. And so to keep us uh, competitive, uh, if not Connecticut, then New England, if not New England, then at least the United States. So uh, uh, our focus primarily in Connecticut. Uh, we have three different uh, labs or facilities here. So you're physically sitting in the Atom Lab. So this is our advanced design uh, automation and metrology lab, and this will be part of the tour. Uh, on the other side of the wall is our uh, additive technologies, optimization and machining lab. And I'd like to let people know that that is the most exciting part of CCAP period. So, uh, oh, I, I run that, I'm sorry. Uh, and then last but not least is we have a, a composite center it's a, a public-private relationship partnership with the state of Connecticut, Pratt & Whitney Aircraft, us, and Goodwin University. It's located at Goodwin. Uh, so when we look at the labs that we're physically sitting in, um, we have a lot of equipment here, a lot of assets that are available to run demonstration projects for people. We have a lot of great relationships with uh, uh, the different equipment OEMs and manufacturers that that uh, you know are on the forefront of these different technologies uh, in both the Atom and the Atom Lab. So once again, a lot of partnerships, a lot of relationships. Great example, you know, is Renishaw. So you can see a lot of Renishaw equipment here, uh, and that's a result of our relationship with them. Uh, on an additive manufacturing front. Uh, I mean, if you look at what we do here, really our main interest is trying to help uh, small to mid-sized manufacturers understand and use this technology. But we also work with a wide variety of other customers uh, on a commercial basis or on a program basis on a federal level. So, uh, you know, we have active programs with the Navy, uh, Navy Mantec program and electric boat. Uh, we have an active program that we're working with ARPA. And we have a number of other programs um, that we're working with uh, the DOD and, and large, uh, larger contractors. We also uh, belong to uh, uh, several of the uh, uh, national manufacturing institutes, America Makes being the oldest of the institutes and the one that we have the closest relationship with right now. Uh, like I said, we do a lot of work with the Air Force. Some of our funding comes from them. Um, and we, we've uh, partnered with NASA on several programs. Um, we've, you know, worked with a lot of local, like I said, as well as national and international companies. So some of the people that we've done technology development and transfer with. And so with that, 
uh, we're going to go ahead and get started on the uh, the main part of the forum. So once again, as I was saying earlier, that additive is evolving very quickly. So uh, uh, out of the lab into the into the world of manufacturing uh, and everywhere in between, the materials are evolving incredibly rapidly. So uh, you know, starting with you know really low end plastics to uh, the advanced engineering grade materials that compete with aluminum in properties. So uh, it's really an exciting uh, place to be nowadays. And so our uh, partners on today's program are Adia. So Kevin Williams is gonna be our first presenter. Uh, Nick Gondick is going to be presenting um, on our panel as well as um, a technical conversation. Um, and then Emily uh, is going to be giving us a, a very interesting use case uh, outside of manufacturing for uh, for plastics for polymers. So Kevin is going to start us off. Um, he's going to be talking about the evolution of using polymers or plastics in additive manufacturing. Uh, he's going to define what the, the two technologies are. And uh, as far as additive versus 3D printing, which I think is a great explanation, and then uh, walk us through where we were and where we are and where we're headed. So without further ado, Kevin. All right. Hello. Everybody hear me okay? All you people online, raise your hand, make sure you can hear me. Good, I can see you. Okay, uh, life is a journey, um, not a destination. That's a famous quote, Ralph Waldo Emerson, circa 1860. Um, but to me, it's a reminder that more, the more we try to find shortcuts in life or in our job, whatever we're trying to do, the more difficult it becomes to see the way we should be going. I think this is uh, particularly good advice. It's gonna flow throughout uh, my slides and when I talk to this concept that uh, implementation of additive manufacturing, which is still fairly new considering all the technologies that are used to manufacture parts today um, or whatever it is you're attempting to do, um, it, uh, it is a journey. And I think don't be ashamed of it. You're gonna make mistakes along the way, um, but you just, continue to push forward. And it's important to not only go on that journey, to accept that journey, but also to plan for it. So you know better what to expect. My name is Kevin Williams. My background is engineering. Um, I grew up in Connecticut. I went to school in Boston, big Boston sports fan. Um, came back to Connecticut, spent the better part of my career, 12 miles east of here, working for the Gerber Scientific Group of Companies. I grew through many engineering positions there. When I left uh, there around 2012, I was their chief technology officer. Uh, we dabbled in a lot of industries. I was in a 2D world. Everything we built was 2D printers, 2D Cartesian coordinate robots, lots of automation. That enabled me, part of my journey, that enabled me to be on the radar for a little company in Rock Hill, South Carolina called 3D Systems. So I actually took a position there, relocated to the Carolinas, and I was a chief development officer and I ran worldwide engineering for that business for about two years. Um, interesting job, met a lot of really great people. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the history. So a lot of that history, all the way back to the beginning, particularly with stereolithography, is very personal to me because I know the man who invented it. Um, and then I came back to Connecticut combination of opportunity to do something that was extremely different for me, which was to be a management consultant, work on strategy and operational performance. And that's how I met the group uh, that is now Adia. So that's my journey. So I thought that maybe it would be good to do that. Um, I'm joined today, as uh, Jeff had said, by two colleagues that are here in the room, one that's remote. Um, Nick Gondak uh, and Kate Porter are in the back. We're all gonna be here after the talk and during the tour. Uh, we've already had some great conversations. Hopefully we'll get a chance to have more. Emily is uh, gonna tell you about a great project we have going on with Mystic Aquarium and I think you'll all find uh, very interesting. So before we go too much further, um, 
I often see on online uh, in periodicals, I see this, I won't call it a controversy, but I see this budding debate. Is there a difference between 3D printing? Probably should advance slides. Look, too far. There we go. Is there a difference between 3D printing and additive manufacturing? Depending on who you talk to, some say there's no difference. They're, they're exactly the same. They're just different ways of talking about things. And that's fine. To me, I do see a distinction, maybe not a difference. To me, um, if, you're, if you're producing a part and you're using a 3D printer, then you're, you're going to get some result off of that printer. Chances are, and there's a good chance, that that part is not going to be fully functional in whatever you use uh, that printer for. You're going to have to do something to probably post-process that. So the end-to-end -end process that starts with the conceptualization and design of the part, the 3D printing of the part, the removal of supports, if it's appropriate and applicable based on the technology, and the post-processing of that part, to me, is additive manufacturing. Synonymous to me is if you were talking about subtractive manufacturing and you were machining parts, a CN machining, CNC machining center is producing a part, Subtractive manufacturing is the overall end-to-end -end process. And as Jeff knows, because he's got CNC equipment here, there is a lot of post-processing that typically goes on with any traditionally manufactured part. So hopefully that's clear. Um, some more definitions, really. Um, ASTM has uh, nicely provided us with definitions for what is known as the seven additive manufacturing methods. Again, I apologize to you, to those of you that are using printers and do it every day and you're saying, all right, move on with it. This is, this is boring, but there are folks that maybe this is new to. So for our purposes, we consider that there are seven different additive manufacturing technologies. Um, it starts with a lower energy, what is known as stereolithography, referred to on here as VAT polymerization. It advances to material jetting. Uh, there are two major players in that, 3D systems and Stratasys. I'm not saying they're the onlys, but they're definitely two of the largest that are producing products uh, that are used every day in industry to produce lots of parts. Um, binder jetting is not just a plastic. Uh, it is also metal. You, there's a little company not far from here up in Massachusetts called Desktop Metal. They do a lot of binder jetting. Uh, that's metal. Uh, material extrusion, there's some examples uh, around the corner. There's a Mark Forge printer. There's a Stratasys printer there. That's uh, extruding uh, filament through a heated nozzle, layer by layer. Uh, sheet lamination is uh, a technology you don't hear all that much about, but uh, it, it is similar in a way to uh, an ex uh, material extrusion. Instead of laying that uh, layer of plastic down as a thread, uh, you advance a sheet. It's kind of like the copier machine that the sheet of plastic comes out, heat's applied, and then they weed the part, uh, the rest of the part off. Um, powder bed fusion, we're going to talk a lot about powder bed fusion. Uh, we've got a lot of great examples of some of those parts uh, on the tables over there. And that's uh, your uh, selective laser sintering, um, a selective laser melting process, which is more for the metal side, and then multi-jet fusion. We'll have some examples of SLS parts and multi-jet fusion parts on the table. And then you've got direct energy deposition, uh, which again is to a, a, a really high energy thermal process. So again, definitional, um, we're gonna talk uh, obviously in the timeline a lot about uh, um, SLA and, and now the newer uh, DLPs uh, that are out digital light projections. So it's instead of using a laser, you're using projectors to cure resins. Um, one other definitional um, slide is if we're going to talk about polymers, let's all understand that there, there are uh, really three classifications of polymers to start thermoplastics, elastomers, you know, rubbers, things that are going to be very flexible, and thermosets. Um, examples uh, of them uh, are typical uh, acrylics and PVC pipe, Home Depot, blows. There's a lot of PVC pipe around. Those are typical thermoplastics. 
thermal sets, maybe not as notoriety, uh, 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 as no notoriety but epoxies, silicones, uh, and polyurethanes typically fall into those categories. The typical um, understanding of thermoplastics versus thermal sets, thermoplastics will melt and are typically recyclable. Thermal sets do not melt and are typically, typically not recyclable, but that is somewhat changing. Um, elastomers are flexible. They can be in both categories. So that's why they appear kind of in the middle. And as we said, we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, a lot about selective laser sintering. So you've got uh, SLS and multi-jet fusion are thermoplastics uh, that are um, semi-crystalline uh, and I'm um, not gonna get into the physics behind what that means, but uh, it's, a, it's a small powder, uh, encapsulated powder, I'm not going to call it a pellet because it's smaller than that. It's like a grain of sand that it is basically melted together. So it, it gets you a good uh, um, form uh, of that uh, um, uh, melting together of those materials. Uh, and it gives you a good uh, multi-axis adherence. So if we move along now into the journey, 3D printing. Um, this is really kind of interesting to me as I was doing research for this for this talk. Um, it goes uh, 3D printing probably goes even back further than 1980. There was probably a lot of work that was going on at universities and research facility, uh, facilities that maybe didn't make the press or uh, really aren't uh, didn't get as much advertisement. But there was a, a, a gentleman Hideo Kadama in. Uh, Japan in 1980 that is the first known uh, engineer that actually worked on the development of stereolithography, the curing of a liquid resin into a solidified part. Unfortunately, and for whatever reason, don't really know why, that technology was never commercialized. He never filed for patents on it, uh, so uh, he uh, did not pursue that. But my former boss, Chuck Hall, did. 1983, uh, he invented the first uh, stereolithography machine. 1986, the patent was granted and he started 3D systems. So um, he is often referred to as the father of stereolithography. He's won all kinds of awards. Uh, he's a terrific gentleman, uh, great guy to work with uh, and work for. And he is still very active in the business today and I think he's either 81 or 82 years old. Uh, he's, he's one of these American inventors and entrepreneurs uh, that is just, he can't let it go. He's in the lab every day, continuing to evolve and develop uh, technology. So analogous to Chuck Hall, there was a father of SLS uh, known as Carl Decker. 1987, he was a student at the University of uh, Texas at Austin, and he was working with uh, uh, Dr. Joe Beeman uh, on uh, forming plastic parts out of powders. And he uh, actually did file a patent, started a company called DTM uh, in, uh, 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 I would say, the late 80s, early 90s. And that company was acquired by 3D Systems in 2001. So the work that 3D Systems is doing today, the head start came from Carl Decker. Um, and in 1989, FDM kind of got its start with Scott and Lisa Crump. They're known as the ones that have kind of uh, developed the initial extrusion formats that uh, we've all been uh, so accustomed to. Um, there's, a, there's a number of different other items on here. This is a bit of an eye chart. Um, not necessarily going to uh, uh, sit here but um, and, and read through all of them, but please, uh, if you're interested. Um, as we advance through uh, the timeline more to the present, um, there's some significant uh, occurrences, particularly around a little company called MakerBot. Anybody ever hear of MakerBot? Anybody ever own a MakerBot here? Um, so we've... Uh, uh, we see that come about in around the 2009 timeframe. Advanced to 2013, Stratasys acquires MakerBot. And as they say, the rest is kind of history. There's also Mark Forged, Ascentium, 
MassFit 3T are founded in uh, 3D are founded in 2013. And then again for this talk, MultiJet Fusion came about from HP in 2016, and a color version of that uh, product uh, came about in 2018. So we talk about uh, the journey and. Uh, wanted to offer a, a good example of what that journey might look like. This is a company called uh, General Atomics. Uh, this slide comes out of a presentation that was done in the 2021 uh, AMO show out in Chicago, uh, or actually this was in Florida, right, Nick? Um, so they, they got started on their journey back in around 2011. They progressed through with uh, a number of acquisitions of FTM technology. Uh, they got to about 2018, 2019, they started getting extremely serious about putting together their uh, a, a dedicated department center of excellence in the company. Uh, they evolved into a, a real ecosystem with strict definitions of what it meant uh, to be able to design and manufacture parts. And then they, they, they as they moved their way through, they further um, delineated their ecosystem with a definition on one axis of what the various steps were gonna be from rapid prototyping to engineering development of low volume production to second and third tier structures that are actually gonna be used for production all the way up to primary structures. They then along the bottom axis to find the technologies that they thought might be most appropriate uh, for those uh, given conditions. And the symbols are to say, in 2021 about where they are with those particular technologies uh, and, and their comfort level on whether they're ready for prime time or not. So I just thought it would be good to, to kind of talk about things like this because this is real world. Um, as we said in the timeline, stereolithography had a head start. Uh, commercialization of those products occurred uh, well before commercialization of any of the other technologies. But in 2021, the crossover has occurred between powder-based polymers driving uh, market consumption more than resin-based now. So the significance there is due to a few things. One, the machines have gotten uh, uh, better and less complex to operate. HP's multi-jet fusion is definitely aided in that. That has really kind of jump-started that whole production process with their uh, well thought out end-to-end uh, -end process in that technology. And, and the availability of materials and the cost of those materials has dropped fairly significantly. Good use cases. We like to talk about application and use cases. I got this one right off LinkedIn. Uh, as a doctor in Australia that threw this up there. These are, this is a picture taken before surgery of surgical guides that are all designed and printed out of stereolithography, or I'm sorry, out of SLS, uh, material, and this uh, takes the place of trays full of uh, guides that are adjusted and sterilized. So I um, thought this was interesting to share with you. Again, real world. Um, this is another one here. I'm hoping that this is going to run. Whoop. Going the wrong way, Jeff. Is the video not going to run? There it is. There we go. This takes about two minutes, but I think it's worth it. It's almost odd to think about it. We started off so small. Probably the entire manufacturing force was about, you know, 10, 15 people. Yeah, you, know, you felt like the energy from the minute you stepped in the door. I had never uh, seen a company that used technology to transform lives. And the question was, is can technology and innovation really allow you to do that. I guess I believed in that and, and believed in the leap. I saw this investment come in over the facts about straightening teeth without wearing metal. And I just, it just intuitively felt great. And it was crazy at that time, 20 years ago, to just imagine with a 3D software, we could move teeth. They were confident that there was going to be a lot of demand in the market, but the founders were really worried about, can we scale? And when I started, we were doing one every week. Well, I start with a line. We're looking at the 50 cases a day, 100 cases a day. When I look back at what we did back in 2000 and today, we're probably having the same volume today 
in one day versus what we typically see in a year. Our softwares and clean check, but also all of the internal systems have allowed us to scale and to better serve our customers every day. We're transforming an industry. We're taking an analog manual process and we're digitizing it. One of the primary technologies we use is rapid prototyping, 3D printing. We've been able to continue to perfect that to make it into a mass customized engine that runs 24-7, 365 days a year. But it's not just about the aligners. It's the materials in the aligners. It's how they get formulated. We develop our own because off-the-shelf material doesn't meet our requirements. And we continue to make these signs better and better. We're the largest mass customization of medical devices company in the world. This opportunity that we have of transforming smiles of, of literally half a billion people is unprecedented. Okay. Um, obviously, the companies align technologies. Um, so when I was at 3D Systems, that was a company when they called, everybody jumped. Uh, that is, without a doubt, the largest customer of 3D Systems uh, and probably has the largest installed base of stereolithography printers that you will ever see anywhere in the world. Um, but they do a phenomenal job. And that was another example of uh, being on a journey because you heard them say how important it was to put all of the pieces together. So just quickly, um, where's additive headed? A little prognostication here. Uh, if you look at the statistics today, it's about a $15 billion industry if you add up all of the elements of it. It's projected by 2030 by uh, most of the experts that, that do this uh, type of estimate to be somewhere around $76 billion. A billion dollars sounds like a really big number, and it is. But when you think about the, the amount of trillions of dollars that worldwide or global manufacturing is, it's still a, a fairly small number, somewhere around four to five percent. Um, so growth rate is great. Out of uh, that number, uh, about thirty percent of it uh, is uh, attributed to uh, metal. So that's projected to be somewhere around twenty-two million. So still a long way to go for metal to catch up to where plastic is. Uh, industry consolidation uh, will continue both in hardware and software and down the lower right hand corner is an example of somebody that I certainly didn't expect to be getting in, but Nikon just announced the acquisition of uh, SLM technology, which is one of the, I would say, top three metal printing companies uh, that have been uh, working in the world. Um, the fourth axis is already being talked about. That fourth axis is not tradition like you think in, a, in another axis in a machining center. It's typically related to like a metamaterial characteristic where the material itself would uh, maintain a shape if subjected to a certain amount of force or temperature, might change color, um, and that is actively being worked on. And as we talked about for post-processing, it's not just really critical to additive manufacturing, it's becoming its own business. If you go to um, you know, various trade shows that are, uh, are in the industry, you will see, it used to be you'd see several of them, but now there are whole sections being dedicated to companies whose sole purpose in life is to post-process various types of parts that are 3D printed. And the service bureau, which is part of that number, that 76 billion is printers, materials, and service providers, there's always been a strong service bureau base. Shapeways came about in the 2008 timeframe. I think they were the first ones. Um, it is really starting to shift now to more of a contracted AM solution providers. Some examples of those below. Vulcan Forms is not just building printers. They're building a facility that is a printer. Um, Accelerated 3D, they were a, uh, they were a Texcars company in, uh, in Hartford sponsored by Stanley. They're building a, a very large FDM printer headquartered down in Austin, but their whole purpose in life is to replicate that into facilities to produce parts for people. And there's also a company in Boston called AB Corp that is, uh, um, is doing something similar in that they are not printing for the pay, they are becoming an outsourced partner for a number of companies. So uh, that's all I was gonna talk about today. Jeff's ready to pull me off the, the stage. 
uh, and I'll turn it back over to you, Jeff, and then we can do questions whenever, uh, whenever you want. All right. So thank you very much, Kevin. The, that was very good. Um, moving on in the agenda, um, we're going to have a, a conversation or discussion around additive. And uh, actually, uh, Mike, if you want to want to come up this way. So uh, Mike Rochelo is a executive vice president and CFO of PTA Plastics. Um, they're a Connecticut company that has uh, embraced additive and uh, is onboarded it and is doing stuff with it. Um, so he's going to present on, on PTA Plastics, who they are, what they are, where they started, what they're thinking about, where they're headed with it. Uh, and then we're opening up things for questions. So um, uh, we'll ask you questions. The audience is certainly uh, invited as well as our online guest. Um, and we'll invite a couple other people up to answer questions with you. So, so come on down. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm not gonna add anything technologically to this discussion. Um, it's gonna be about the journey. It's about how we deployed it, how do a small to mid-sized manufacturer can adopt. And uh, give you a little bit of background on uh, PTA. And when we look at PTA, we're a, uh, a small to mid volume manufacturer injection mold of plastic parts. And we have a captive tool and die shop. So we began, the company was founded in 1953. We're an employee owned company, which is an important element for us. Uh, it's important for our employee base, our employee owner base, but we've also found that to be very effective as we go out and discuss with customers, there's just been a tremendous amount of merger and acquisition activity. Uh, customers are often afraid of who's gonna be the logo on the door of the company they're working with tomorrow. So this provided an element of stability, allowed us to maintain the company culture that grew us and what was positive about us. So we really are proud to be an employee-owned company. Um, primary services, again, you when our claim to fame is no one will ever buy from PTA because we're the uh, cheapest. So it's really the upfront design and engineering and assistance that we provide to our clients, to our customers, our most successful projects come about when we're engaging uh, from the napkin sketch stage. So we do do in-house mold making. So we have um, uh, mold shops, both in Connecticut and Colorado. We have two clear bases of operation. We do injection molding, primarily engineered resins, um, a lot of value add. Over 90% of what we mold has some post molding touch to it. Very little do we shoot and put in a bag and ship to the customer. Uh, that can be um, ultrasonic welding, that can be post mold machining, pad printing, and a ton of mechanical assembly. As we move forward in, um, in our journey with medical device manufacturing, process validation became a key element of us being able to support the medical device industry. And then we do uh, specialty molding. We do two shot over molding. We do um, in mold decorating, uh, structural foam molding, other applications. Yeah. Market served again, as I said, we're about 82% medical. What we do is medical device related. Nothing really goes inside the body. We'll do handheld tools, we do housings. A lot of what we do is boxes, pl fancy plastic boxes that somebody stuffs electronics in and it's bedside patient, it's laboratory test equipment. Uh, one of our largest customers uh, 
saves lives, uses our products. We like to say a big chunk of our business is going into life saving with defibrillators, both AEDs and in a hospital type defibrillator devices. About 15% of our business is, um, is defense related. Um, this, we're sort of in an area where other people, it's the inverse in, in the geography, but about 15% of what we do. And then safety and security. Uh, quickly go through. So, you know, again, our commitments, early supplier involvement, design for manufacturability, support with selecting materials, and then tooling design. Um, I'm going to blow through these. It's, you want to know, go to ptaplastics.com and you can see all of these slides, but we'll go on. Now, what I wanted to do is spend the, the bulk of my time today talking about how we got there. And in um, 20. 18 PTA formulated, we were going to do strategic planning, but I've been other places. I have a bookcase that has six three inch binders, and each of them is the strategic planning objectives that we did. We reviewed and we put in a binder and never looked at it again. So I wanted to do something different with strategic planning. So our strategic planning became what the vision for our future was going to be. So we coined it PTA 2030, envision the future. So we've tried to approach strategic planning from a non-traditional standpoint. Um, so, you know, our, our, one of the, our catchphrases was we either get Netflix or we become blockbuster. You know, I mean, that's just the change. And you can pick anybody else out there, what Amazon did to traditional retail. So, but we wanted to create a line of sight that kept us from being blockbuster. So was core focus, envision in the future, and this is a big part of it, and that was disrupt, disruptive technologies and models. You know, we had some traditional stuff that we set um, revenue and profit goals, which are an element of strategic planning. But, you know, we wanted to take a look, looking backwards to plan what the future was going to be look at what voice of the customer was, a traditional SWOT analysis, but create it from the forward-looking standpoint. And then the big point we talk about here is talent was the key, that that became just tremendous investment and focus in people and development. So we built out this timeline. I've got a purpose. We've got um, um, our quadrants of vision. But what we did was build out a timeline that started from 2019, went out to 2030. And Industry 4.0, we talk about it, Industry 4.0 uh, became one core element on that timeline. And as we looked at Industry 4.0, you can pick whether it's the one, two, or 20 items that you put under Industry 4.0. We weren't by any means an expert, but what we did was develop people and started an educational journey that allowed them to explore these varying technologies, come back to the core strategic team and say, hey, here's what we've learned. Here's what we think we should be doing. And we talk about additive manufacturing. I circled it, highlighted it, became a key element of our industry 4.0 focus. Again, we're, we make plastic parts. So we looked at additive manufacturing and 3D printing and said, is this, and we're low to human volume. So is 3D printing going to take away a chunk of our business? So do we need to defend against 3D printing and additive? Do we need to coexist with 3D printing and additive manufacturing, or do we need to embrace it? And we ultimately came to the conclusion that we needed to embrace the technology. So we formed a team, you know, it was PTA Plastics Additive Explorers. That was our additive team. And we set them to work to work with us to put the plan in place. So it became three phases. It, we were gonna develop knowledge and interest company-wide in this. We created groups of employees. We opened up and in each of our facilities, we brought in a small $600 3D printer created a library, created a training program. We used our experts. Anybody in the company across our 250 employees could sign up for time slot on 3D printing. 
uh, small systems. And we have people making repair parts for their dishwashers. We had people that were making toys for the kids, business card holders, you name it. There's you know probably 500 applications that that came out of that. So we set up these workstations, one in Connecticut and one in Colorado, and we worked to deploy what that was gonna look like. Here's, here's a picture, excuse me, dry, dry mouth. Here's a picture of what that workstation is. We replicated it in both our facilities. And so there's a computer there, there's some printer there. People didn't have to worry about supplies. They didn't have to worry about anything. And out of that came a, or group that became our, our 3D printing team in both of the facilities. So we moved. So you can see here's some examples um, that we use. You know, there's <laughs> the, the, the uh, uh, Lombardi Trophy and, you know, Christopher Columbus's ship, a chess set. One of the things that came out is if you see that, um, that QR code, that QR code is now throughout our shop. And if there's a maintenance issue or a safety issue, you snap that QR code, it calls up a report, you fill in a couple of items and it shoots it back into our maintenance department. But that came out of our, out of our 3D printing team. Somebody was fooling around with it. Our safety committee got a hold of it and that's the way we deployed it. Next, we took our phase two. So, our team, again, the approach was, we're not gonna go all in, we're gonna transition through it. So we build a lot of fixtures. I said, we, we do um, a lot of in-process inspection. We do first article, we do capability studies. And we had deployed a lot of robots on our machines and we were doing a lot of assembly work. So our tool shop was fabricating fixtures. All of a sudden, the 3D printing became was more and more propagated throughout the facility, and we we set a target to move what we could to 3D printed fixtures. So I would say probably set, at this point, 70% of our uh, end of arm tooling is now 3D printed rather than other traditional uh, methods. All of our inspection fixtures, and virtually all of our inspection fixtures. And a number of, we, we were going through process improvement, A3 events on our assembly lines. And they say, well, geez, if I could hold this, if I could do this, I can do that. Well, we could set that 3D, set that up as a 3D printed job and pilot that literally the next day. So what we did was move from a learning process into beginning to monetize 3D printing and additive manufacturing. One of the challenges we had there is we've got some really talented designers and our designers knew how to design for subtractive manufacturing. So they had a very closed box on what they could do. So we were designing for additive, those, those designers were designing for additive. So jobs took a long time to run. They might've been missing features. There's a lot of things. So we had to shift the paradigm, shift their thought process and get them out of their box of comfort as they began the process of designing for additive. So we worked with ACT, now at ADEA, um, in terms of training um, a group for design for additive. Um, we got supported. It was a fantastic program. There was a program um, actually, Paul Strebel's here somewhere. We made an application in a competitive bid process for a grant for additive manufacturing. We were very fortunate that we were one of six companies awarded the grant. We got to deploy larger, much larger scale uh, 3D printing capabilities within our building, which allowed us to succeed. So, um, we had we went from doing nothing to having a several week backlog on on the 3D printer. So it's like we went from we didn't know anything about it to we can't live without it. And there was a backlog associated with it. So it shows you the transition that can happen over time. Um, so here's just, just a quick picture of some of what we're doing, some end of arm tooling. Uh, this is an automation cell we have where we're uh, fixtures, assembly fixtures on that, um, on that uh, table. 
are were all fabricated 3D printing and in you know three years ago those would have all taken a month to get through the machine shop to get machined up because of backlog so it's you know a, again we're um, um, holding fixtures in that lower uh, uh, right hand or you know, lower right hand corner that's an inspection fixture again you can see the emphasis on end of arm tooling and assembly fixtures that we're working with there then we move to phase three and this is we're in very early stages of phase three but this is really supporting our customers the pre-sales process the sales process and the implementation process with um with 3d printing so what we're doing is working with our customers in early stages on proof of concept we're able to uh manufacture prototypes for them we're able to respond quickly to design changes give them feedback we're learning more about correlating the results out of um, printed parts and what that's going to mean to the way we approach the tool build what their functionality is going to be uh, so it's become a key part of our design for manufacturability um, and it also assists us with tooling design so what we're able to do is compress the customer cycle from going to napkin sketch to product realization and that's that's you know time is money in this market so to the extent that we can compress that and put that time slot either monetize it for the customers because they're faster to market or allow us to do things differently in the build cycle it's of tremendous value often they're able to go through in the medical world they're able to um, begin 510k or their pma uh, process for their device approval with 3D printed prototypes that were we provide them. So the you know customer supports you know high quality functional printed parts uh, demands we we've actually taken on and some of the things we thought would might be a threat we're actually doing some very low volume production parts as we've learned and as customers have adopted it. So we're you know we're where the cost for the NRE to build a tool is prohibitive, we're now in those low ranges supplying plastic parts to them and allowing them to get into their validation cycle much quicker. So what we did was we wanted some place to be different. So we took a, an area of our shop and we, you know, we bead blasted and epoxy coated the floor and put up glass enclosure. And we really wanted it to be something special. And if you got to work in there, it was something special. People aspire to work in there, be part of that. So you can see, and we've replicated this. Um, we did it first in Connecticut. We're a um, little over a year into it. And then we've, we've just begun to deploy that a similar philosophy in structure and department in our facility in Colorado. Um, we have two, excuse me, um, as, as a, one of my guys, our flagship printers. So we, it's um, FDM technology that's in Colorado and our anchor printer in Connecticut is at HP 540. Again, what we'll find, and I think I'll talk about it later is we have actually three major pieces, major types of 3D printing based on what the application is, what the needs are, and that's FDM, uh, powder bed fusion, and SLA. So we wouldn't be nearly as successful as if, if we had confined ourselves to one printing technology. What we talk about here is it became, um, resource constraints so our guys built out a smart sheet application so we have a process where jobs are submitted in time is quoted on them we monitor utilization we have the team members that are authorized to work on it and we keep a library of everything we did so there's there's the model of the part that we did what um, what printer it was printed on, who the end user was, what the times were, we keep a lot of data for it too, because we wanted to really rationalize the investment. Was it 
our, our, we moved it from being a commitment of risk capital to deploy it to monetizing it successfully. So kind of the lessons learned, and this is this slides came from the or my the additive explorers. So far, we haven't found a holy grail for printing technology. You know, they said yet. Yeah. So I guess they're optimistic that there will be a holy grail. Not sure. Um, what do you want to do? Their their uh, their item was their their point of view was that there's three or four or five columns, and you only get to pick from two of them. You only get to pick from two of them. So uh, at least that's where, where we're at. And it's the aesthetics, it's the accuracy, it's the strength, uh, physical properties, uh, mechanical properties of the parts. And then, you know, what they've learned about post-processing, post we way underestimated what that was, was, was gonna be, you know, sort of early vision was, okay, this would be nice. I pick up a part, it's good to go. Well, post-processing, is as important as the printing aspect of it. Talked about this a little before, design for additive. That was shifting the thought process on the folks that were doing design. We're used to putting a block and turning a spindle to get a part out. Well, it's different. And it's different in a lot of positive ways that you could do things that, you know, if you were machining, might have been unattainable to do. And again, we found that one printer technology was not enough. So we have actually adopted three different printer technologies. And then this is our kind of our go forward. And, um, you know, it's, it's again, we continue, that team is authorized and is empowered to continue to stay on top of technology, continue the educational journey. Um, experimentation, you know, they have, it's not, you know, we, we've moved and had to shift managers, a lot of people, that with this, it, it really is okay to fail because each failure creates a learning process. So it's new materials, process settings, approach to design, all of those. Education, you know, building our capabilities to further service our customer, both internal and external customers. So again, we want to keep pushing our own limits. Um, Again, you know, if you're not failing, you're not trying. So again, it's that process of, of pushing the envelope. And then we're keeping a close eye on metal 3D printing. Um, again, we're a tool and die shop also. So this could be uh, game changing if we were to bring this in house. We're procuring uh, printed parts in um, that we have to do uh, machining, finish machining on, but allows us to put conformal cooling circuits, get, allows us to change both cosmetic and uh, um, geometric, the tolerance and dimension our parts because of the way we're able to cool the tool. So we, we see big benefits to that. So did I make it on time? <laughs> and I'd be happy to answer any. Oh, oh, okay. I get to say. So, anyway, does anyone have any questions that uh, for Mike? We'll give you a microphone. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, what type of uh, software do you use for the post processors? You're talking. I told you at the beginning. I wasn't the technical guy. I honestly don't know what our team uses. Maybe Kevin can probably answer you better on what's a bit, what's out there for post processing software. I sorry, mea culpa. Yeah, Kev, <laughs> Nick, wanna join in on that? Okay, go ahead. Um, you you mentioned the uh, that you started to get into manufacturing parts. Um, a product with your 3D printer. And one of the things that I had heard is high mix products with low volume 3D printing is a good application. And notice you also do injection molding. Do you see a, a, a place where someday you might not be doing injection molding or you'll be just making everything with 3D printing? We don't see that. And that's just based on our business model and the markets we serve. I mean, if we were a molder that only molded widgets, yeah, I could see that happening. So when we're molding, when we're 3D printing 
uh, low volume parts, it's typically parts that um, uh, are mechanical parts um, within some sort of assembly buildup. And a lot of what we do, it's, um, it's large, large parts, cosmetics are critical on it, um, often more critical than tolerancing and, and, and dimensional stability. So that we're not, at least not near term, we don't see that low volume moving to move into 3D printing. Um, but that's, again, we're keeping an ear to the ground all the time to understand where that goes. Just, just to follow up on that then. So the parts that you are making, they weren't, are they new products for you or are they replacing some of the things that you were doing with injection molding? Both, but primarily new parts, new, parts. new products. Then okay. that's where the customer, um, it does not have, you know, we've, we've had some very small startups where we're working with them, where they don't have the finances to go out and tool, um, you know, tool a product, or it may be a short shelf life product where they don't manufacture enough parts to amortize the cost of hard tooling for that. So it's, for us, we're using it selectively in the right model, as opposed to making it a business focus. So they typically support a program, the 3D parts will support a program of a lot of parts. And, and where we're looking at it, that's a customer we want to partner with on a long-term basis, and we'll get them launched. We'll find a way to get them launched. Do you find that you can 3D print most materials that were traditionally injection molded? A lot of materials that were traditionally injection molded. And, but that, that comes with the adoption of multiple printing technologies, gives you access to different libraries of available materials. So we've done, uh, we've done some elastomeric materials. We've done rigid materials. You know, nylon's our friend in the, <laughs> in, in the 3D printing world right now. So... Here. I think that's where, you know, the, the other guys can talk about this, but that every, every time you move the needle, you move that availability of materials, that's, that has as much in my mind of what's going to create the large leaps forward in, a, in adoption is material. You know, you get the guy from, guys from Henkel here that, you know, that are, that make their livelihood out of out of that kind of stuff. So we try to stay close with them. We know it's the case because all of the major, uh, all of our major resin suppliers have large scale operations exploring um, um, material for printing. So they were in the traditional marketplace. Sorry, so did that answer your question? I don't know. And uh, to follow up with that, do you seem to have or do your customers have trouble with material qualifications with what is currently available for 3D printing? We, uh, again, understanding where we fit in this, it's typically prototyping. And when they're going for um, 510K approval, it's designated that this will be an injection molded part, but we're creating the functionality for it. So it hasn't been a roadblock for them because again, most of what's going through qualification are printed parts or transitional parts as opposed to end form parts. Thank you. Sure. Okay, we have an online question and then we'll do one more. Yes. So there's a question from the audience um, remote. What CAD software does PTA use for design and process? Uh, we use Symmetron and we use SolidWorks. Um, so that's those are our design platforms. We, we had a large base of, of Symmetron. Symmetron's a CAD and CAM software that's for really tailored around the injection molding industry. And then we interface with our customers primarily with SolidWorks. And again, I still can't answer the post-processing question. Right. <laughs> Last question. Uh, you talked about the uh, learning curve going from subtractive manufacturing design to additive manufacturing design. And I was just wondering, uh, how do you incorporate the benefits of additive of in 
reducing your overall part count by using additive techniques as opposed to subtractive techniques when most of your business is um, injection molding. Well, where we've seen the benefit of that is in our approach to end of arm tooling and our fixturing where that was the biggest thing where we learned the advantages of additive manufacturing where we weren't building up something out of seven machine parts, it's two printed parts. So in, in our approach on uh, from, from the customer standpoint is when we're supporting them with prototyping, if it's, um, if it's 12 parts in the bill of material injection molded, it's 12 parts in the material in the bill of material 3D printed because again, we're using that as a transition into injection molding. Our approach would be different if we were focused on selling 3D printed parts, but that's not really not really our market. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, I hate to tell you this, but that was probably a textbook case of how to bring additive into your company. I'm impressed. Thank you. So it's very good. Appreciate it. All right. So one of the uh, topics that uh, that Ron talked about in his opening remarks and that Mike uh, alluded to is that uh, the state of Connecticut does have funding available for small to mid-sized manufacturers. And uh, so that can be a significant part right now. Uh, uh, Paul Striebel is going to come up and tell you about it. Uh, but with the additive program that, that Mike's company was involved with, um, you were eligible for a $100,000 matching grant. So that's a big chunk of money uh, against onboarding additive technology. And uh, there's uh, a few dollars available still. And, uh, and Paul Striebel, who manages uh, the portfolio of grant programs that we have uh, here at CCAT is gonna talk for a few minutes on what programs are available and, and how you would uh, address those. So thank you, sir. Advance this with the keyboard to advance the, the slide. Yeah, sure. sure, sure. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Paul Striebel. I'm a program manager here at CCAT, and I have the privilege of running several state funded grant programs that I'd like to spend uh, just a few minutes uh, talking to you about. I should first say that this is a great time to be in manufacturing in that we have an unprecedented number of manufacturing assistance programs running at the moment. So hopefully by the end of this very short presentation, you or somebody you know will have the advantage to take, to take advantage of these programs, I should say, um, so that you can actually get some money for manufacturing. So if you include our engineering internship program, which is about to launch, we have a total of six programs. We have three on the technology side, which are designed to help you acquire new equipment and technologies. And we have three programs on the workforce side, which are designed to help you expand and grow your workforce. In all, there's more than $200,000 to be had for any qualifying manufacturing company should note that you can participate in one of these programs or all of them if you're eligible. These programs are all administered on a first come first serve basis. And you also should note that there's a matching component to these programs, whereas for every dollar you, uh, you receive, you have to spend at least a dollar yourself. So although there's differences between the programs, they all do share some basic qualifications. First of all, you need to be a manufacturer or allied service provider. So what does that mean? That means you actually need to be producing a product or you have to be adding value to a product such as a welder, plater, powder coating facility would do. Secondly, you need to be manufacturing in Connecticut 
this program will not support manufacturers that simply have a sales presence in Connecticut. Applicants need to be registered as a business with the Secretary of the State for at least three years. And applicants also need to have a minimum of three full-time employees. And most programs allow up to 300 employees. And lastly, it should go without saying, you also have to be in good tax standing with the state of Connecticut, um, specifically with the Department of Revenue, Department of Labor, and with your Secretary of State registration. One other thing to, to note is that on the technology side, those programs require that you submit your application prior to committing to the project or to purchasing the equipment. So that what that means is you should not place a purchase order, don't put a deposit down, don't sign an agreement with your supplier until you've submitted an application requesting uh, funding assistance. So the first program I, I wanna talk about is the Manufacturing Voucher Program. This is actually our legacy program. It's been running for nine years now. And this program has awarded over $30 million to Connecticut manufacturers. Most people use this program uh, to assist with the acquisition of new equipment in that the program will provide you with up to $100,000 of assistance. A couple, th couple important things uh, to note about the program. $100,000 is the lifetime maximum. So if you don't need or don't request the full 100,000 in your initial application, you can come back uh, until you've eventually meet, met the lifetime threshold of 100,000. The minimum project value uh, at the moment is set at $25,000. So that means you have to propose a, a project of $25,000 or more. And with the, uh, the price of machine tools and other technologies these days, that's uh, not really an unrealistic uh, number to achieve, I'm sure. Uh, the matching requirements for, for this program do vary a little bit. For first time applicants, the program does require a two to one match. So that, that means you get about 33% or a third of the total project cost potentially paid for by the program. And if you're a repeat applicant, the match requirement does go up to three to one. So the assistance would be about 25% of the total project cost. So the next program is the IoT Innovation Voucher Fund or simply IVP program. This program has been running for about two years now and it will provide up to $20,000 in assistance. This program supports industry 4.0 type projects. Most people are using it to acquire robots, 3D printers, we've been speaking a lot about today, and for data analytics uh, software and the like. Uh, the minimum uh, project value here is $10,000 to apply, and the match requirement is only one-to-one. -one. So a brand new program that was just announced is the Siri and the Cyber Assistance Program. This program is aimed at providing assistance for cybersecurity assessments, and also for those interested in having their smart industry readiness assessed. This program will provide you with up to $10,000 on a one-to-one -one matching basis. So on the workforce side, the incumbent worker training program is a very popular program that CCAT just actually inherited from the Department of Labor. Unlike the, uh, the three technology uh, programs that I, I just spoke about, this workforce program is administered on a reimbursement uh, basis. So as such, you need to complete and pay for the training prior to submitting your application. And the focus of this program is on providing training uh, that will upskill and provide promotional opportunities for your employees. This program will provide up to $50,000 per year on a one-to-one -one matching basis. It does also have a lifetime maximum of 100,000. And the final program is the 
Apprenticeship Funding Program, or AFP. This program provides employers with a wage reimbursement for having apprentices working in their operations. This program requires that both the employer and the apprentice be registered with the Department of Labor be before you submit an application to CCAP. So empl employers can receive up to $15,000 for each registered apprentice during the course of their apprenticeship program. Employers can furthermore apply for up to four apprentices per year. So I know there was a lot, so, but the complete details for each of these programs along with their application can be found online. You can go to CCAT's website, which is ccat.us. My email address is also on this screen. Uh, so you feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have now. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you very much. So just to reiterate here again, this is, uh, uh, if you're a manufacturer, you know someone that is, this is a tremendous program, uh, set of programs. Uh, we actually had a company in that left just before you guys arrived and uh, they had just made an investment and this would have uh, taken a nice chunk out of their uh, investment. So uh, be aware of it. And once again, as Paul said, just a reminder, it's not a reimbursement program. It's meant to be an incentive program to add technology and add assets to aid manufacturing. All right. So with that said, Emily Turkin is going to join us. She's strategic account manager at Adia to talk about the Charlotte project. Hello, Emily. Hi, how are we doing today? I am excellent. And you? Very well, thank you. Good. So Emily's going to share with us on a project that uh, they've been working on and uh, for um, Mystic uh, Aquarium. And so with that, I will leave you alone. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Emily Turkan and I am a member of the IDEA team. If we could advance to the next slide, please. Uh, just a quick overview about who IDEA is. Um, we provide 3D printing equipment, materials, service, and support throughout New England. Uh, we've recently implemented uh, different tiers of consulting programs that are highly based around application identification. So companies who are just getting started in 3D printing, for instance, we help identify um, what I would call the low-hanging fruit of applications, where they can get started quickly and successfully, um, and then help them build a roadmap uh, for the future. Uh, we offer comprehensive training on all the equipment that we sell, as well as equipment we don't necessarily carry in our portfolio. Um, we have a very intelligent staff that um, has the ability to kind of go that extra mile um, in terms of moving outside of our portfolio. Uh, we also offer different types of um, software, whether it be reverse engineering, design, or metrology. Um, and we also offer uh, engineering services and support, which can pretty much be tied into um, our 3D program, consulting programs. Um, to the right of this slide are the partners we're currently working with in this space. So for Loctite, we distribute their materials uh, throughout the continental US. Um, and for HP, Form Labs, and 3D Systems, we deal with their um, hardware as well as materials, and we service the printers that we sell. Uh, we're very particular about our portfolio. So we don't sell every printer, say, by 3D Systems or Form Labs or HP. We kind of pick and choose what we find to be the most reliable, you know, the best types of materials offered, um, easy to use, um, and, you know, print software, et cetera. So, um, we're very strategic in terms of how we bring products um, into the idea fold, if you will. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a snippet of, you know, kind of the companies that we work with in this space. So as you can see, it's pretty much all over the board um, from, you know, shoe companies to companies such as uh, our friends over at PTA Plastics to universities. Um, so it really, 3D printing can be, can be implemented really anywhere. It's just a matter of having that game plan to make it a successful endeavor. Um, so, you know, the companies that you see here, um, we've been working with for a very long time. This is our 13th year um, in this industry. So we've managed to um, build quite the network over time. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this is what I'm excited to share with you. So um, we have formed a very nice relationship with Mystic Aquarium. Um, down in the bottom right, you'll notice the penguin and the boot next to her. Uh, back in 2016 is when our relationship with Mystic started. Uh, we were contacted to assist with um, a hurt penguin. Um, there was a local middle school that we sold a printer two years ago. Um, the aquarium knew that this middle school had a printer and it basically went from there. So we were brought in and we worked with a group of middle school students to help uh, facilitate the creation of this boot. So that boot was designed by 10 to 13 year old kids. Um, and we had originally printed it on a multi-material composite printer, which is what the picture shows here. So it has a, a rigid uh, bottom. Um, the outer of the boot is more of an elastomeric flexible material. And there's actually, which you can't see here, a very uh, rigid insert that's inside of the boot to give more support. Um, this material is a prototyping material. So it degraded pretty quickly over time. Um, so we connected with our partners at Loctite and they helped us in, they literally created, formulated uh, a specific custom material for Perps the Penguin. And she's still wearing that boot today. So that was a very exciting kind of progression in that project to be able to, um, you know, work off the original design of the boot from the kids, but be able to produce it in a material that um, was, you know, um, lasted much longer than, than the first one did. Um, so that brings us to today. Um, we are, last year we were contacted by Mystic. We had been talking about the turtle for many years. Um, they knew they wanted to do something around 3D printing, but weren't quite sure how to get started. So what we ended up doing was we partnered with a company in Rhode Island to have them assist with the 3D scanning of the turtle, because we knew that we needed real data to work off of. Um, in the past, uh, Mystic Aquarium would epoxy weights to the back of her shell. Um, what happened to her was she was in a, a boating accident uh, many years ago. Mystic rescued her, or Charlotte, I believe, over 15 years ago. So the boat propeller hit the back of the turtle, which rendered the back flippers paralyzed um, and tore a small tear in her GI tract, which uh, creates an air bubble, which is why the turtle floats as such. Uh, so the equilibrium is off. And this is a very common problem. Um, in aquariums that have rescued sea turtles that have you know, undergone this type of uh, trauma. So Mystic had started epoxying weights to the back of the turtle such that they could equal her out a little bit more, um, but they found that the epoxy was actually creating sores on the surface of the shell because the shell is a living thing. It needs to slough or to shed. Um, so at that point, they were having to dry dock the turtle because the sores were so bad they needed to heal before going back in the water. Charlotte did not like that. So they knew they needed something that wasn't as permanent, stays on, but not stuck on. So we decided that a, a harness would make the most sense. So we 3D scanned the turtle and we used that data to create the harness. Now, our team understands that we can't be everything to everyone. So we pull resources when needed. And for this particular project, we called on our partners at New Balance. Um, the reason being is because when this uh, Perks the Penguin story uh, hit the press, they called us and asked why we didn't ask them to participate. We're shoe guys, why didn't you call us? And we explained that it was really about the middle school students and kind of, you know, that whole workflow. And it, it was just the way the project worked out. Either way, they asked us to um, reach back out if we ever had something like that come across our desk. So that's exactly what we did. And they uh, were generous enough to put a couple of their um, computational designers on this project, uh, just volunteering their time. Um, so we've been working with them. We've had about four iterations printed with three fittings um, on Charlotte. Each one has given us you know, more information as to is the material right? Is the design right? Um, are there any changes that need to be made? Uh, so New Balance was doing most of the printing up front, and then we roped in um, another company we work closely with, um, OPM here in Connecticut, Oxford Performance Materials. So we inquired with them about their OPEC material um, due to its biocompatibility and low water absorption. So um, after putting the newest version of the harness on her and seeing her um, in the water, putting it together was a little bit more difficult because um, the OPEC material is a little bit more rigid than the, uh, I believe the last one we printed was in a nylon 12th material. Um, 
So, you know, it's a learn by doing process. Again, every time we put her in the water, we learn something new. And just like the kids being able to see the penguin walking in her boot, seeing the impact of their work in real time, it's very much the same for us with this. And uh, we're very excited to see where this project goes. And it's it's just fun to get, you know, like-minded people in the same room to, uh, you know, hoping for the same cause. Um, and again, this is a very common issue around the world in aquariums with um, rescued sea turtles. So we're hoping that by doing this project, we can create some type of, of uh, general workflow such that other aquariums can kind of take advantage of the solution. So uh, there's a short video here. Um, I'm not sure if there's a if there's a, a video embedded on this slide or if it's the next one. Yeah, so here's just a short clip of um, them putting Charlotte into the water. Not sure if it'll play or not. If it won't play, no big deal. You can, uh, oh, here it goes. <laughs> The first time we put her in the water, actually, we were all waiting below and she managed to get out of it. By the time they put her in the water, it must have been caught on something. So that was very disappointing. <laughs> um, but again, it's a work in progress and uh, we're very excited to kind of see where this goes. And the technology used to print her harness um, and all the materials we've tried so far is selective laser sintering. So that um, for us, you know, it's... It, we're happy to help how we can. And again, we can't be everything to everyone. So we, we, you know, we rely on our partners for, for parts of projects that we aren't necessarily able to undertake ourselves um, alone. So I don't know if anyone had any, any questions about the project with Mystic. Any questions? Yes. Is the goal of the harness to add like a counterweight so that she swims um, normally? Yeah. So if if you see the back of the the back of the harness had, and um, I believe Nick brought some of the extra parts that we had that he can show you um, from the latest harness. So the back part has a spot for about four or five uh, cylindrical weights. So we've also been doing the trial and error as to how much weight do we actually need to create the, the right buoyancy for her. So that's also a learn by doing process. <laughs> Another question? Hi, um, can you talk a little bit more about the inception of the project and the partnership between yourself and the middle school? Like how did that come about? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so years ago, we sold the local middle school in Mystic a small FDM printer. Uh, when 3D Systems was producing their cube printers, um, we sold one to the middle school. And the aquarium uh, actually helped the middle school apply for a grant to purchase that printer. So the aquarium was aware that the middle school had a printer. And the chief vet at the time very forward thinking, knew she wanted to create the boot for the penguin in a different way than she was because it was, she was using, you know, silicone, traditional silicone molding clay. It was very bulky. It was very difficult to even get it on her, get it off of her. Apparently birds and penguins can see in color and the molding clay was purple because of her name, yellow purple. That's what they call her. Um, perps for short, <laughs> and they would have to wrap it with black vet wrap anyway. So it was just a very cumbersome process. Um, so she knew she wanted to use 3D printing and she reached out to the uh, middle school knowing that they had a 3D printer just to get started, just to see if if anyone there had any idea in terms of, you know, the, the main librarian, Sue. She was the one who kind of headed that whole technology department. Um, and that's basically what happened. They called us and said, hey, you sold us this printer and, and the aquarium is looking to X, Y, Z. So at that point we were sold because we love working in education and kind of seeing how kids embrace this type of technology with no fear at all. Um, whereas, you know, some engineers are still in the, we don't want to change the way we do things phase. So it was nice and very refreshing to see these kids even ask questions that I wouldn't have thought to ask, you know? So it was, uh, that's pretty much how it got started. It was just, you know, past relationships that kind of have, would come to the forefront and um, yeah, the middle school had purchased the printer. I think it was about seven or eight years ago. 
So it was just the fact that they were aware of the printer and, and that was really the only, the only place they knew of to start, to start looking. So we're very glad they started there. <laughs> All right, Emily. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, much. In intriguing use for uh, for additives. So that was cool. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. I can't imagine that uh, some older people are fixed in their ways and don't embrace new things. That that's odd. All right. So. Our next presenter is Nick Gondick from uh, ADEA, once again, Director of Additive Manufacturing. Um, Nick has a long history of working with companies to solve problems and to inject new technology. Um, at our previous forum that we did in the spring, we, we had a, a polymer a plastic section. Uh, and so today, actually, Nick's gonna be talking about a couple uh, of the technologies that we didn't talk about in our spring uh, forum. And I think maybe recapping some changes in one of the technologies that we did, but uh, Nick is a tremendous wealth of information. So come take the stage, sir. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, oops, already messed up. Okay, um, I'm Nick Ondek. I am Director of Additive Manufacturing at Adia. Um, I've been in the 3D printing space for probably close to 11, 12 years. Um, jumped into this space directly out of college um, with a background in engineering physics and essentially became a user really, really early on. Um, have a lot of experience in, in powder bed um, with metals. Um, that's kind of how I started off in additive. Um, then was given uh, access to a ton of, uh, of industrial equipment without user manuals, um, especially none written in English, and was told to figure it out. So I became an expert pretty quickly on my own. Then um, with the, the customer slide that Emily showed you, I've learned a ton from our customer base. So, um, And so today's talk is going to be a technical discussion about selective laser sintering. Um, so I'm probably going to bore everyone here. Um, I'm going to try to keep it kind of high level then um, and really just focus on that one technology and some of the attributes of that technology and why you would utilize it. Um, though, disclaimer, you kind of really, you know, taking a deep dive into understanding what process is optimal with additive, you, you really kind of have to understand the whole process landscape and the materials landscape to understand what makes most sense. Okay, so um, first we'll talk about powder bed fusion. Um, so what is powder bed fusion? It is the process of taking a focused energy source and scanning a, a bed of um, powder feedstock. And that, um, that energy source typically is a high powered laser, um, which through that scanning process fuses that feedstock either through melting or sintering it. Um, and again, um, powder bed fusion does encompass kind of a really broad range of, of AM technologies, which can process metals, polymers, ceramics, and other materials. Um, and, and I'm not going to get into some of the, the hybrid types of additive manufacturing processes, but there are like the HP multi-jet fusion, which has similar characteristics in terms of um, its process capabilities. But um, one, one thing to note is here, I'm going to talk about SLS or selective laser sintering, and that is essentially powder bed fusion of polymers, whereas when you were talking about metals, we'll usually refer to that as select, selective laser melting. Um, but that's a little bit of a misnomer because we're actually melting the polymer. It's just kind of a term that's stuck in the industry, calling it SLS. So SLS is powder bed fusion of, of polymers. So this is a kind of a typical diagram of an SLS system. And if you're familiar with other systems, it could be reminiscent of like an industrial SLA um, 3D printing process. But again, here you have the laser, which is mounted above the build platform. And that is, will scan the powder bed um, 
usually directed by a series of very fast rotating mirrors. Um, and that, that scanning process is scans to, again, selectively melt a cross-sectional area of your, of your build part. Um, okay, so some of the attributes about these, these systems is that, you know, they do have typically, you know, um, pretty complex thermal controls, process controls, high power lasers. Um, and in some cases with some materials, they need to have um, environments to support that but in, in their environments. So usually historically, these machines have been much more expensive than say another process like SLA with a comparable, with a comparable build volume, but that has changed. There's a lot of change in the past five years um, to make systems much more accessible. Um, the, so, and during this process, what is different than metals, which allows kind of a really fast high throughput is that we're actually heating the powder up to close to right below the melting temperature. Um, and what that will do is with a given uh, energy, uh, you know, source of a laser, we can move much quicker. But what else does that facilitate? So it allows us to produce these parts um, with very, with minimal um, stresses within within the components. Um, and therefore we can actually have them be supported during the process just by the unfused powder around it. And that, that actually is a very unique attribute of this process. Um, it also allows us to get really, really good mechanical properties. Um, you know, speaking about things like FDM, you know, of course there are cases designed apart where that process you could have very, very strong components. Um, especially if you're using like a, a system for which you're having a, a fiber reinforced in a certain direction, but typically SLS is, you know, some of the, the most robust, strong parts that you could produce in a polymer machine. Um, and, you know, it, it's unique because it allows us to build parts with features that could range on the order of a, of a meter cube, but get really, really high resolution. Um, and truthfully, this machine is for given its resolution, it's definitely has the highest throughput out of any other process relative to like FDM, SLA. Um, so that is unique. Um, one, one thing about every 3D printing process is nothing is turnkey. There's always, um, you know, secondary post-processing steps. And usually, you know, this is where DFAM comes, you know, in, into play, kind of understanding from, you know, initial design to end component. But a typical bare bones process of, of working with SLS is you remove the powder, remove, remove the parts from the, the powder cake. And that is usually um, done you know, by a human. Um, there's not really been many cases of that being fully automated. Um, then essentially once that's done, um, you would want to then remove any residual powder left on the surface. And you know, there could be steps of either brushing the initial part off, um, trying to reclaim as much powder as possible. Um, and that powder removal process, the step two is typically done with a, a, a bead blasting system. Though some uh, you know, small companies that don't want to deal with that, they'll just literally brush parts off. Um, but typically that you're always hitting it with a um, you know, compressed air or light bead blast. Um, then there is a multitude of processes for what you can do after that. Um, you know, there's a lot of innovation in these surface treatment processes for SLS to get really, really nice surface finishes, you know, that we are seeing our customers implement for end use parts that they're printing and selling to companies. Um, okay, so this is kind of just a landscape of materials, and this is probably the most exciting part about SLS. Um, and th this is a pretty well known chart. Um, and here you will have blues commercially available. Um, yellow is kind of saying in scientific literature can be done. Um, maybe it's not optimal for the process or the, you know the the process. Whoops. Conditions, but so in the, in the center here we'll see the most common two materials is PA11 and PA12. Um, they're very you know robust materials that are that are very well suited for the process. Have have high good good throughput and good recyclability. Um, then kind of on the, the this peak here, you'll see literally peak and peck materials. That's what, you know, here in Connecticut, OPM is very well known for. It's a very high performance material, um, very innovative stuff. 
Um, we're seeing a lot more in, in elastomers being developed in this process and a lot of play in footwear industries. One of our company customers, New Balance, they, you know, they've actually assembled a team of material scientists and developed their own TPUs for end use components. Um, they have parts that have been in the Olympics, Stanley Cup, um, what have you. So very, very interesting, innovative stuff. Um, and they were also kind enough to utilize their systems to help us with the Charlotte project. Um, da, da, da. So, and again, that's really it. So, okay, I think this is what is the most interesting thing I wanted to kind of talk about with um, with selective laser sintering or even HP like processes. One, so the fact that we could build parts um, without supports is is incredibly interesting. It it allows for a breadth of of not only for prototyping and, and having, you know, the ability to produce these parts and not having to worry about, you know, um, support removal. And kind of, you could see here, just the, the breadth of complexity, um, but it allows a whole new breed of designing for additive where we can do, you know, meta materials, complex structures, very lightweight structures. It allows us to do, um, to consolidate parts much more easily. Um, and of course, because it is a powder bed system, you can pack parts in three dimensions, which is definitely an advantage. It could be a disadvantage if you don't truly understand the process or, or have the need, but you know, we absolutely see it as an advantage, especially for throughput. Um, and the material performance, incredibly. New share. Sorry about that. Why am I presenting from this one? You do. Sorry about that. <laughs> Technical difficulties. I always joke saying I'm, you know, everyone else in that's a few um, years older than me within our organization. They always get really confused with specifically with teams or anything of that nature. And of course I'm the one who usually messes things up. Okay. Um, yeah, so in, uh, again, I, I think the parts speak for themselves and the applications do. Um, it's a very, it's, it's a very impressive technology, but again, it, it does have its place in the landscape. So um, to kind of demonstrate that, I'm just gonna go over a few uh, additional application stories. So th this one is unique. Um, this is a, you know, a, a, a story from Boeing. And again, you know, in they're, they're, they've consolidated an assembly and saved a lot of time uh, and money in, in essentially that consolidation process. They were able to reduce the total weight of the component um, and minimize the many manufacturing steps, consolidate them. Um, what is process unique is that, you know, having these internal channels and, you know, the ability to, um, to essentially modify the interior surface for for airflow um, is is facilitated by the ability to produce complex parts in SLS. Um, so it's and again the robustness of the material, its strength I think is you know what would lead you know somebody to identify an application of this nature and quickly select SLS as the appropriate process technology. I think this is a very cool story um, and we're seeing a ton of innovation in this space. So this is a, a, um, a company called Invent Medical. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so this is a, uh, an organization called Invent Medical. Um, and so th this, this product here, it's, it might be hard to see the detail, but just looking at the geometry of this product, you could see it's complex in nature. Um, and actually that internal surface will become compliant. It's, it's, a, it's almost as if it's a lattice structure um, and they, it's definitely a meta material design. Um, and again, that is facilitated by this supportless 3D printing process. Um, it's also very lightweight and they produce this as an end component. Um, and again, their, their business model is unique. This is for a treatment uh, option for, for infants who have, you know, um, that have specific head shape deformities. And, and this helps in, re, in reshaping a head 
um, at a young age and it's very lightweight. It's, it's much quicker to produce um, than how they were doing it um, originally. And there is a lot of advantages to having this complex structure to better conform over time as this injury is being healed. So um, very, very innovative stuff. And we're seeing, again, tons of applications in this space, um, especially in sports medicine, things of that nature. Um, and I think this is kind of the bread and butter of most 3D printing um, applications, but okay, so Rome Snowboards is located in Vermont um, and they're a small company. I think they have two digital designers and they have a team of eight, um, but they compete on a big scale if anyone snowboards. Um, and they've always been known for making really customized or highly specific snowboarding gear. Um, so their time, their development um, processes, they have to be very competitive and move quickly. So they, and the way they were prototyping was very rudimentary. So um, they, they wanted a process that they could print these complex structures for bindings, not for end use parts, but they wanted prototypes, which they can, you know, really beat up. Um, so they're actually producing these bindings and riding them down mountains um, and validating them before putting it into production. So I think it just goes to show that, you know, this technology over the past, five years has become so much more accessible. And this is really, again, the bread and butter. It's really strong functional parts that you could have freedom of complexity. It's kind of a unique story. Um, and this is one for which I don't think many people have heard about. So Chanel has been an additive. They've been exploring it for well over 10 years. Um, they've done quite a bit. Um, and for this application, they have identified actually uniqueness to additive to make these mascara brushes. They could hold more material. The surface roughness has actually been, um, has been advantageous for this product. Um, and it's actually because its size and its complexity, they've, they've built a business case and they're producing 1 million of these parts um, a month, approximately, um, according to them. You could go on their website now and buy, you could just, search 3d printing and you'll see you could you know purchase these brushes you know today um it's a very high volume application of of sls and use part so um and again there's other companies like small direct who compete against invisalign that use each you know an hp process similar to sls for mass manufacturing so this technology is very accessible um and it could you know again very functional parts and use parts um, we've seen it, you know, obviously a lot of aircraft applications um, to jigs and fixtures, so similar to what PTA is doing. Um, it's very cool stuff. Okay, then the last slide I have is we're, we're having an Oktoberfest, um, October 6th. So we welcome everyone to come. Of, of course, there's going to be beer and food, which is definitely a poll. Um, but we, we do have all of these technologies. A large breadth of technologies at our facility. So if you want to come in, get your hands on some of these machines and parts, we, we welcome everyone to come. And any questions? Um, when you talked about nesting parts in SLS applications, how do you prevent part deformation or warpage if you're not adhering to the build plate? So the parts are supported to are supported by the powder itself. So they don't they, they're think about you know digging a part out of a sandbox, right? It's just held in three dimensional space. There obviously is there there is some concern of warpage, but that is essentially addressed through understanding how to best orientate a part and to how to design a part. And you know there are softwares which kind of look at the whole bucket of parts as a whole and we'll position them to, again, to minimize warpage. Um, that's something for which, you know, is, is it's an art form. It requires skill and understanding, but that's also something which we're seeing great acceleration of kind of codifying that, that type of know-how into software to, to automate that process. All right, more questions? Are you using the, I've heard, I've seen it other places with uh, precious metals, CNC machines and precious metals? So in, that's a metals question. So I would definitely def 
<laughs> to, to drift. But yes, precious metals are utilized, to my knowledge, in selective laser melting and also in new binder jetting processes where I've seen some, some applications there. All right. Are there any other questions specifically related to what Nick just finished talking about? And if not, then what I would suggest is that we're a little bit ahead of schedule here um, by a few minutes. But what I'd like to suggest is that we open up the floor because here again, Nick is a tremendous technical person on all aspects of uh, polymer printing and, uh, and let's expand the scope beyond your presentation. That's why I asked what I did. Okay. So with that, are there any questions about anything related to polymer plastics? I knew you had one. I was going to ask one if you didn't. Thank you. Um, what, what software would you say is the most uh, industry-wide for this type? As a, as a starting point, where should I begin if I wanted to choose a software to use for um, slicing, right? That's what it's called. For slicing? Is, is that what it's? Yeah. Or design slicing so usually it, it's process dependent and typically many people will either live in the software that is produced or developed by the machine itself um or there are some applications which kind of span multiple technologies and multiple manufacturers like materialized magics um they are complex um and they are expensive and truthfully there's you know the progression of software developed by oems is getting really really good you know um Form Labs has, you know, at least for that scope in their SLA, um, it's pretty powerful software for desktop machines. Their SLS platform is very impressive. Um, 3D Systems has, you know, a, a print preparation software that spans all of their printing technologies and one unified interface. Very good. Uh, Stratasys also makes great products. So I would say usually, you know, it's the landscape of kind of sticking with an OEM. It's, for the most part, I would say it's it's unless it, it, that's a different conversation for desktop or low end systems, but in the commercial space, for the most part. If you're printing parts with voids using this process, is there any way to get around the powder being encapsulated in that void? So um, yes and no. Um, so there are some cases we actually have the, the colorful shoe model on, on the table there. There's actually loose powder on the interior of that model um, and that is stuck in there. And essentially that just reduces the weight, right? Because we're not fusing it, it's less dense. Um, but usually when you're designing for additive with these components, you want to design for cleanability. So you will have to be able to remove that powder somehow. And if you could design your part to make that very easy, that's more optimal, saves time on secondary processing. Um, we've even seen some cases where people have channels and they'll actually just print a tool that's kind of floating in that channel and that when the part's done, they just pull that out and it removes that excess powder. So you could be very innovative there. Um, and yeah, so. Other questions? All right, here's a materials question. I'm a small machine shop and I've started printing my own fixtures and jigs for, you know, work on the CMM and inspection and all that kind of stuff. Um, I've tried using uh, fixtures, you know, in the machine. Um, I've got some stability issues and I have a problem in that my coolant wants to eat up the plastic that I'm using. Are there processes or materials that might make sense for me to explore, or is that a better metal uh, process or use? And I think Kevin could also jump in on answering this, but you know, polymers are very powerful, and especially with um, secondary processing. So, you know, vapor smoothing technologies has allowed much more chemical robustness. Um, SLA technologies also um, have very high you know, the ability to customize for chemical resistance. So it's very prevalent in, um, in that type of handling. Um, you know, SLS may be not um, most optimal because of absorption. 
Yeah, I was just going to add uh, one thing. Um, thermal sets, we talked about thermal plastics and thermal sets. Thermal sets are really good for that type of an application. Um, they're not your grandfather's thermal sets, right? They turn yellow, they're brittle, you drop on the floor, they shatter. So for instance, 3D systems, I happen to know the process engineer really good. You see him all over LinkedIn. He's now testing every thermal set that they release to the market for both one year out to eight years, both in, inside UV light um, exposure and outside exposure. They also, and they publish all of this, every spec sheet, we have them all online. You can go online and get them yourself. Um, we'll give you the charts of everything they've done to mechanically test, uh, but as well, they also show you what chemicals they've tested and they test through a very strict regimen. Trust me, it's very strict. Every single material, they have to publish that information. And their typical coolants, their typical, um, they test with gasoline, they test with kerosene, they test with oils, they test with water, obviously, but they'll tell you what will happen to those materials over time. So there's an option there for them. That's saying it's gonna be a solution for everything, but there are a number of options for that. And as Nick said, if you can get the structural properties that you need or want out of nylon or glass filled nylon or carbon fiber filled nylon, um, you can seal the outside with various post-processing process that will make it, I won't say it's waterproof, but it's certainly water resistant, maybe enough to be able to get you through some number of builds and then you just regenerate the tool again. Okay, thank you. I do, yes. Here again, questions from the floor. Anybody have questions? All right. So Mike talked about um, his process that he went through and and here again, I'm blown away that they actually envisioned that this is a direction that we should go, and then they got a committee of people to to participate in that. Um, is that when you guys help introduce the technology to companies, is that something that you see or or a lot of times what we're hearing, there's a person that wants to champion it. So what what does it look like when most companies uh, introduce the technology or thinking about it? So um, it, that's across the board. I think what PTA did was very interesting and the right thing to do um, is that they made this technology accessible. Um, and usually what we find is companies that bring it in-house and have it accessible to employees, what they'll do is they'll go through an application discovery phase. And again, you know, maybe a company will bring it in uh, a technology based on one application where they built a business case. But having that, that openness and exploration will help build a team, find who those subject matter experts are and bring them together. Um, and usually what we find is a, a very fast acceleration. I think um, the, the, the path, what we saw with General Atomics, the slide Kevin showed, that's similar to how I would characterize PTA. And that's, you know, an amazing, you know, an amazing approach. And I think what is necessary, um, then it's kind of consolidating that know-how and disseminating and across great teams of people and you know where we where we have seen companies fail is when there's one subject matter expert and they're doing incredibly innovative things and that person leaves um, to another organization and everything comes to a, a you know um, a halt. Um, so yeah, I think again the approach of kind of you know having it accessible and exploring applications and having that flexibility, um, you know, it also just I think generally accelerates innovation within an organization having that tool available. Thank you. Any other questions? No? All right. So I think what we're going to do is bring this to a close. Thank you very, yep. very much. Of course. So much appreciated. Thank you. Right. And our next presenter is going to spend uh, a few minutes. Um, oh, here's contact info. I'll leave that up for a second. Our next presenter is Eileen, who's been manning the uh, online folks. And uh, so she's going to be talking about uh, CCAT and some of the upcoming events that we have scheduled. And then when she gets done, we'll bring things to a close. So thank you. So hello, everyone. Glad to see you here today. 
Um, we're expecting Paul Lavoy, Connecticut's chief manufacturing officer, shortly, but I don't think he's checked in yet. So, um, so I hope he will be coming soon because I'm sure you'd love to meet him. Say hello in person if you've never met him before. And he is the most open and, uh, you know, he likes to say he's a cheerleader for manufacturing in Connecticut. And I would absolutely agree with that. He loves to connect all the resources that many of, so many of them that DECD and the Manufacturing Innovation Fund have asked us to help administer for them, but all of the other different resources you have available throughout the state as well. So just to back up for a moment and speak a little bit more broadly about CCAT, if you haven't already gotten the impression of what else we can do for you, CCAT is an applied technology center and our work is focused on, and the work of the engineers, especially those that you'll meet today if you haven't yet already met them, is focused on helping companies address what their issues and challenges are. Take a look at what upcoming or emerging technologies are available to help address those challenges. And then take a look at, is it, do you need to have an introduction to that? Is it something we might do in a webinar? Is it something we might do in a, in a in-person training like today or a longer training? And then understand with you, do you wanna explore adapting this technology for your use? Do you wanna do a prototype of something? that could help apply that solution to your obstacle, your challenge. And then we'll help, in a sense, serve as your free research and development arm to help you explore, will it make sense? If it makes sense, then as indicated in what Paul Striebel shared earlier, we have so many different grant programs to help offset the cost of you adopting that technology within your operation. So it kind of goes hand in hand. We are open and accept um, new applications and interests and inquiries to have our team consult with you all year long, all the time. So please don't be shy and know we wanna do that. Then if you adopt some of the advanced technologies, we will take a look with you at, do you need additional training for your team? Is there other incumbent worker training you can give them so they can onboard the knowledge to the knowledge level where you are now? So next up, one I want to mention also is can be an approach that you can take to help up train some of the incumbent workers within your operation. So you can um, utilize this system, which is 180 Skills. It's a virtual learning platform. We have free licenses for it at this time, and we'd be happy to help your company apply to access more than 750 classes that are available through this online tool. It would, once we get you the license, you would self-administer for your, your person or yourself or someone on your team who wants to learn a new technology. We especially recommend some of these programs and we can help you group together. Ed Marinko on our team can help you group together what would be the smartest flow of a group or a package of courses. And, and we'd be happy to help you with that. Just down here at the bottom, you see there could be a series on intro to powder bed fusion industrial robot applications, um, metal 3D printing, robot safety, or basic concepts of PLC programming. But there are also courses and classes on lean manufacturing, on safety in the workplace, on introduction to Lotus, you know, or Excel spreadsheets. So like you, at, you know, you look at it, there's a lot of choices there, but the majority of them are geared towards what manufacturing, what industry needs. Um, upcoming events that we have going on over the course of these next few weeks and into November. These are some of the technical trainings that CCAT is helping host. Some of them are available in person like Creaform and this Renishaw training. Others are available hybrid, so in person and remote like we're doing today. And frequently we also have events that are available just online. The majority of the time, we also record our events. So if you miss something, you can still access it and pull it remotely on demand. So keep that in mind as well. We're really excited about a similar summit to this, but we really anticipate using all our square footage here for a smart manufacturing summit coming up. It's a full day event and it will be coming up on October 18th. And we have all of these links on site at ccat.us backslash events. And it's really part of our promotion um, and our partnership with funding from DECD and the Manufacturing Innovation Fund of Oc October being celebrated, not only for next Friday, which is Manufacturing Day, but we like to celebrate in Connecticut all month long. And dare I say, we really like to celebrate it all year long for anyone who's involved in it and involved in all of the, 
you know, the organizations like CCAT who help serve the manufacturing sector and industry. So some of these programs that are listed here, again, the Smart Manufacturing Center's um, careers tour is on site at Goodwin, where you would see the other facility, CCAT's Advanced Composite Technology Center, and that's on October 25th. Dr. Sal Menzo will be making some comments at that event at around 3.30. And our target audience is really parents and students, but we also welcome community. We welcome not only students from high school, but students who are either out of high school, not sure about college, changing or wanting to transfer, and maybe wanting to explore what they could get in an associate's degree from Goodwin. We will also have there several employers and some of their um, young rising talent who can help answer questions and talk about their career path into manufacturing careers. On October 13th, we are gonna launch what we're calling our Maker Multipliers website. There'll be a virtual launch party from 2.30 to 3 p.m. It's a very exciting program where we have profiled a number of different industry ambassadors across the state and with a, together with a grant from Stanley Black and Decker, we're standing up this website. And what will happen is it will grow ongoing where we will add more young rising manufacturing talent from employers across the state. So in your companies, we welcome you to reach out to me and say, we have some great people that would love to be profiled and would love to participate. We'll help set up a profile. And then if they want to participate in local school districts who are looking for people to come in and be speakers, we'll help connect them. This website will do some of the heavy lifting for us, but I help coordinate it together with some of our workforce team. And again, that will be an exciting event on October 13th. The second part of um, the discussion is actually a panel of young rising women in manufacturing who represent pathways where they entered um, you know, straight into production on the floor jobs, but others who got their engineering degree and entered you know, at a higher le level into the program. Um, or into the world of manufacturing. So variety of experiences, all great stories and all inspiring women. Our makers also include men. So I don't want you to think it doesn't, but um, like you can potentially guess from this audience here, we always are trying to increase the participation of both more people of color to understand the world of manufacturing and to welcome more women in. And lastly, we'll be hosting another tour like we're gonna do it uh, at four o'clock today. We'll be hosting another tour on November 29th. So if you have friends who were unable to come today or other colleagues you'd like to connect with us or recommend this to, we would appreciate that. One of the things that I'm really passionate about and definitely I know Paul Lavoie is very passionate about and really all the manufacturers across Connecticut is an internship program. So CCAT is very excited about the Manufacturing Innovation Fund having asked us to help spearhead leading the promotion of engaging our young students, our college students that are both here in Connecticut, as well as those who go away to school, but come back for the summer to work in Connecticut small and medium sized manufacturers to have an internship here. And not only do that for one summer, but ideally return a second summer or a third summer, and then hopefully launch into your businesses to be your next hired, um, your next hire once they're done with their schooling. So what we did this past summer, um, the timing of the grant coming to us had us have a slightly later start, but we still amped up with a great mini program. And that included hosting a group of over 35 interns. We had a kickoff day here and did a tour. We had comments from Dr. Jackie Garifano, our CTO, on how to establish your social branding, your social media message, your LinkedIn profile, and what that could mean to your career. We next went on a tour of uh, Webco Plastics a couple of weeks later. And then thirdly, Paul Lavoie helped us coordinate a tour downstate in Stratford at CubTech Medical Imaging. And Paul came and was our keynote speaker there. It was fabulous. He helped share what the ecosystem of manufacturing in Connecticut is like. And the feedback from those interns is not only did they get that experience of how great the company where they had direct in-person mentors, where they produced work, where they were committed to the team and celebrated by those manufacturers who had them as interns, but they got to feel a broader sense of community. They got to enjoy a sense of connectiveness and also get eyes into and walk in the floors and inside the doors of other organizations that might've been manufacturing paths or different operations that they hadn't 
ever interviewed with or experienced. So it's broadening their understanding of manufacturing. And we see that just being a huge win-win for those students, for their career paths. As a parent, I guess I'd say as their, for their parents too in their future employment, but definitely for the manufacturers and the employers through the state. So stay plugged in for this. There'll be more information coming out about it, um, both on social media from CCAT, and we'll, we'd love you to help us spread that word. As you can see, I didn't read through the slide, but we will be providing an internship toolkit for especially for those employers who've never stood up an internship program or who want to look at what are the best practices to take our program from good to great. This is the slide about that maker multiplier program. So in my head, you know, once an intern has stayed here and decided this is the future, they're going to stay here and live in Connecticut and work at one of your companies or one of your neighbor's companies in another year or two, we want them to be a future maker multiplier and share their story and their journey with others who come behind them, that next gen manufacturing workforce. And with that note, I am going to ask if Paul Lavoie would like to come on up and join us. I know he's here. So, so thank you. And hello, Paul. We don't have slides here, but take it away. We don't need slides. Is the microphone? Oh, okay, good. Okay, good. I'll do that then. No, that's fine. And I, I usually like to walk around, but uh, so hi. Oh no, that's oh no, that's fine. Yeah, we're good. So how you guys doing? All right. Did you have a good day today? You had a great day, I bet, huh? Well, the fun part's yet to come because then you'll get to go into the uh, to the additive lab. And, uh, and, you know, have Jeff take you through that. I think, uh, you know, a few people have described it to me that for, for people in our business in the manufacturing business and engineers coming to this facility uh, and then certainly going to the additive lab is like going to Disney World. So, uh, you know, this is where you get to come and, uh, and see all the really cool and new things that are going on. So, um, so I'm glad you had a really good day. I, uh, I thank uh, the folks at CCAT and uh, everybody else that uh, that has been with you this afternoon for your uh, journey through additive uh, for doing this. So in my job as your chief manufacturing officer, um, I, I really need to be thinking about um, the needs that we have today in manufacturing and the things that are important today. But most importantly, my job is to make sure that we're looking out to the future and we're looking how we can strategically make sure that we're positioning Connecticut for success in manufacturing as we kind of look at the horizon of what's coming. Um, and so when you look at some of the strategic things that, that I focus on on a regular basis, it really comes down to three things. It comes down to workforce, right? We all know that we need to have a workforce. We need people. We need people today, but we also need to think about workforce in the dimension of making sure that we have people that are trained for the skills and the jobs that we have today while making sure that we're training people for the skills that they're going to need in the future. And if you think about an eighth grader or a ninth grader that's going to be interested in manufacturing and interested in advanced manufacturing and interested in the future, it's going to take them eight years to get a high school and a college education. And what we're doing today in manufacturing is going to be very, very different eight years from now. And just to give you a little bit of, you know, maybe a little cold water to, to get you to realize how fast things are moving, that General Motors has made a commitment to eliminate the internal combustion engine in all vehicles by 2035. State of California has gone along and said by 2035, they want to eliminate all internal combustion engines. So that means that a child born today won't know how to pump gas because they'll be 13 in 2035. So you want to know how quickly, you know, how we're going to dump what we not currently know about making automobiles on its ear and think about what the future is going to be. And what does that future workforce need to be? Now, you know, we can talk about sustainable air, you know, sustainable aircraft fuel, right? And how we're going to get off of carbon, uh, carbon fuel for aircraft, how we're going to move away from that for vehicles. And by the way, EV, when you talk about EV and electric vehicles, we're talking about flying vehicles as well. We're talking about submersibles. We're talking about drones. We're talking about looking at, you know, how submarines are going to be powered by electricity, how airplanes will be powered by electricity, how short 
hopping air taxis will be powered by electricity. And by the way, all the stuff that I'm telling you about, it already exists, right? So the future's already happened. We're just trying to play catch up to it is really what we're doing. So when we think about it in workforce, we think about it from that perspective, you know, we certainly think a lot about supply chain and what's happening in the supply chain and how we can shorten the supply chain. You know, we look at, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a mission with a lot of people uh, to what I call Connecticut shoring. And that is how do we get Connecticut businesses doing business together with other businesses here in Connecticut? And how do we make those connections? And I think that's gonna be the future for us as well. But the third thing and the most important thing and what you're talking about here is what we call innovation. And it's what it is, is we need to accelerate the adoption of innovation at the speed of relevancy. Meaning that, it, you know, how do we keep up with what's happening? Understanding that the speed of relevancy is accelerating as well, right? So we have to keep up with it at the speed of relevancy while we're accelerating the speed of relevancy. And, you know, we talk about industry 4.0. And what does industry 4.0 mean? You know, people will say, well, we need to adopt industry 4.0 technology. Well, there isn't one industry 4.0 technology. There are several. And my job, part of my job, is to really identify on those industry 4.0 technologies, which, one are going to be, which ones are going to be relevant here in Connecticut and which ones are going to be important here in the state as well. And I don't always get the opportunity to choose that. And what I mean by that is sometimes there are directives that are coming down from Washington, D.C., that are really going to help drive that for us. And I'm going to tell you that there's three specific directives as it relates to Industry 4.0 that are going to be, that aren't going to be. They are critical to our success here in Connecticut. And the reason for that is, is that Connecticut is number two, number two in the country in defense spending on a per capita basis. So there's $24 billion dollars coming from the federal government into Connecticut for defense spending. Now, it's a good portion of what we do here in manufacturing, but it's not everything. We have a huge manufacturing uh, ecosystem outside of the defense supply chain. But when you think of $24 billion coming into Connecticut that's associated with the supply chain, that's something that we need to pay attention to, right? And there's three things coming from the Department of Defense and there are three industry 4.0 technologies, and there are three things that are very, very important to us. Cybersecurity is number one, and making sure that we're CMMC certified, which is the cybersecurity maturation model certification or model maturity certification. I may get my M's mixed up there, um, but it's basically locking down your, your infrastructure and locking down your systems. The second is digital transformation, and it's really all about um, model-based definition, and it's really about taking um, paperwork, paper out of the system. And the third is the reason why you're here today, and that's additive manufacturing, all right? And, and I'll tell you that I've had conversations with the president of Pratt & Whitney, who tells me by 2040 that 80% of aircraft parts are going to be made with additive manufacturing, that there is a program that was announced by governor, uh, by governor, by President Biden, uh, who uh, announced it's called AM Forward, which is Additive Manufacturing Forward, and Pratt & Whitney, Raytheon Technologies, Lockheed Martin, which is Sikorsky, and General Dynamics are all participating with the, with the president in AM Forward. And Pratt & Whitney has committed to 50% of the RFPs for additive manufacturing to go to small manufacturers. Well, Jeff and I and Ron and the folks at CCAT and all of that want to make sure that that work's done here. And that work's done here in Connecticut. So if you think of, you know, uh, well, let me ask the question. How many of you are ready to accept a, a PO from Pratt & Whitney for additive manufacturing for aircraft parts right now, today? Are you? Good. There you go. All right. Excellent. Good. So you're, 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 you're right in line, right? You're, you're right in line. So that's excellent. So the rest of us, we all need to catch up. So, uh, but that's what CCAT is here to do. That's what CCAT is here for. CCAT is Connecticut's technology arm as it relates to, you know, when, it, when they announced AM Forward, so I actually found out about it the day before it was announced. We had a Connecticut manufacturer, Michael Polo, that went with the president to Cincinnati when they announced it uh, because Connecticut is a very important part of this manufacturing ecosystem in the country. Uh, my immediate phone call was to, was to Ron Angelo saying, Ron, let's go. <laughs> we, you know, additive manufacturing, we need to make sure that uh, we're out in the forefront of this. And, and Ron was like, I'm already running. Let's catch up to me, So, uh, which is great. So I encourage you to enjoy your experience here. This resource, this facility is here for you. It's provided to you 
by the state of Connecticut and by other companies and other resources and other investors uh, that are here for this. But this is your resource. This is here to make sure that you're out in front of opportunities, that you're going to make sure your businesses are relevant for 2030, 2040, 2050. And remember, that may sound like 2030, 2040, 2050 may sound like a long way out. You got to remember, we're only three months away from 2023. It's not that far away. It really isn't. So let's, you know, we have to really start thinking about how we're strategically going to do that. And my role is to make sure the state is there to support you along the way with the resources that you're going to need in order for you to be successful, in order for you to be able to adopt additive manufacturing within your operation and to make sure that Connecticut maintains our relevancy as one of the top manufacturing states in the country. You know, we may be little, I call us the big dog in the little dog house. Right? We're the third smallest state, but when it comes to manufacturing, we're the big dog. So I'll join you a little bit on the tour. If you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, you know, to reach out and, and to let me know. You know, as your chief manufacturing officer, you're my customers. Manufacturers are my customers. You know, so I'm here to serve you uh, to make sure that you have what you need. So um, again, uh, thank you to the folks at CCAT for putting this together. You know, thank you for, for taking time out of your day to come here to be able to learn this, uh, and to be able to make sure that you get up to speed. And, you know, and someone once told me that um, that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I can guarantee you today that I'm in the right room. And I hope you guys find out when you get into the additive center that you're in the right room, too, because there's some really smart people here. So thank you.